and now we're all here now so thank you so much for your uh, patience. I'm going to give everyone a few minutes as the number of attendees is still very much creeping up. Lovely to see so many of you um, and then I will make a start. Okay so those of you on Zoom, um, if you'd like to ask a question during today's webinar, um, we'd uh, be grateful if you could use the chat function, um, which is a little speech bubble usually at the bottom of your screen, um, and, and we'll make sure we pick them up. If we don't answer them immediately, please don't be offended. I will try and get to all of them across the whole webinar, and there may be a, a later point where um, it may be more relevant to come back to your question. And then if we can't answer it, we'll do our best to answer it after the webinar. Um, and Hello to everyone on Facebook who's been waiting patiently for us to start as well. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please put um, a, a comment uh, below the video and someone is passing them to me. So without further ado, let's kick off and get started. So I'm Charlotte. I'm going to be chairing today's um, webinar. Um, oh, some hellos in the chat already. Hi, everybody. Um, Dragana, would you mind introducing yourself for me? Uh, so my name is Dragana Milojkovic. I'm a consultant haematologist at the Hammersmith Hospital and I also work with Dr Guy Hanna at King's in London. Thank you. Guy, anything you wanted to add? <laughs> well, there we are. I'm uh, Guy Hanna. I'm a consultant haematologist at King's College Hospital in South London. Great, thank you. David? Uh, I'm David. I'm not a consultant haematologist. I'm a CML patient. I uh, have been for about 10 or 11 years. Thank you. And Nigel? Um, much the same as David. CML patient for just coming up 11 years. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you all for your time. Um, so we're going to kick off today's webinar, which is uh, on the topic of TFR and dose reduction, with a uh, quick presentation from um, Guy. Guy, if you're ready, um, please feel free to take the floor. Thank you very much. Hopefully people can see the presentation now. Any luck? I can. Thank you. Good. So let me see. It. Right. OK. So as I say, um, I work at King's College Hospital, um, treat uh, many people with uh, CML and uh, quite a number of people who are undergoing TFR or tumor free emission. So um, this is meant to be 15 minutes. It might be a bit longer. Um, I'm going to skip through some of the slightly more technical slides, but the point is they can be looked back on for reference. Lots of nice medical and scientific uh, graphs and things like that. But uh, don't feel free that you need to get all the information I'll summarize at the end anyway. So what I'm going to talk about today, a brief case history just to illustrate TFR and benefits, talk about why we bother uh, with treatment for remission, uh, what were the key clinical trials that happened around the world, what happened to the patients who were on the clinical trials, and then other key uh, important thoughts like withdrawal symptoms, what happens if you need to start again, and also introducing the concept of dose reduction. And I'll just briefly summarize the current guidelines nationally and internationally. So this is a, a typical patient. She's 39. She uh, presented in 2009 uh, with chronic phase CML at low risk, and that was her transcript, and she had no comorbidities. So it doesn't fit everyone, but there's enough people that might ring a bell with, and she started imatinib at 400 milligrams once a day. So these days, what is the aim of our therapy for CML? Well, actually, what we want to do is we want to bring down the level of your BCR able to 10% at three months, 1% at six months, 0.1% at, at 12 months, and then keep you in a stable MMR. But sometimes we want to get even deeper emissions as well. So that's the, the overall goal for, for CML therapy. So um, that's what we want to get the molecular response and we want lifelong maintenance and hopefully a near normal life expectancy. But there's also the question of someone has to be on a medication for the rest of life to keep them there or do they? So this patient that we talked about had uh, an optimal, very, very, very good response at three months uh, and continued to deepen her molecular response at six and 12 months. As you can see, those patients who are familiar with their numbers know that that's a that's pretty good, good spot to be in. So we have to think about why we might want to discontinue TKIs. So some things we really do need to, to, to stop the, the drugs for, pregnancy being one of them particularly severe side effects or another disease which stops you being able to deliver your drugs. And the other things that you might consider is how can we make the low growing side effects from the, the treatments uh, less problematic for patients, uh, deal with unknown potential complications. We know that some of the drugs we use do have uh, increased risk for uh, heart disease and strokes and things like that. And also 
people just would like really like to not take a tablet every day if they possibly could. Um, and the things that patients don't have to worry about, but the, the the country has to worry about is how much these therapies cost. And eventually, uh, we have um, over four thousand people in the world who have discontinued TKI in clinical trials. So this patient. Um, had, despite doing very, very well, had symptoms of lethargy and actually uh, she was switched to nilotinib at this point, um, 300 milligrams twice a day. And actually she still remained that very deep molecular remission. And we have to think about what low grade side effects people have on their therapy. I'm not talking about nilotinib, we know it can carry risk factor for, for heart disease, but how does it make people feel? Do they really need to, to continue taking, taking these drugs? And this just shows you the sort of, the like a little flavour of the low-grade side effects people can have on therapy without making them want to stop therapy. So none of these would often make people really want to stop, but you might want to reduce, uh, reduce the dose or, or potentially stop if you possibly could. So things like fatigue, muscle cramps being, being and, mus and pain and edema being sort of the classic things that people are affected by a lot, especially with the matter. Um, they did a survey um, in 2014 started asking people how much of a risk of relapse would you need to accept before you thought about stopping your TKI? And I thought this is just an interesting sort of illustration about what people thought. So if you thought you had a 20% re relapse, actually most people thought, well, actually, I'd quite like to stop. Um, if you said 80% chance of relapse, people would say, no, I don't want to stop. There's 80% chance of relapse. What this, this also says is, what does it mean by relapse and what happens at relapse? And this is not quite uh, encapsulated by the survey, but it's just an indication. That obviously, the more likely you are to stay in dream remission, the more likely you are to want to attempt it. Basically. Um, so what were the clear trials? So the STIM trial, which is stopping imatinib, that was, that was first. And then Euroski, a big European-wide trial, uh, stopping lots of uh, uh, TKIs. And then in the UK, we had Destiny trial. There may be a lot of people on this call who were on the Destiny trial, uh, maybe not. Um, and um, this is the, 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 the big UK trial, and we'll talk a little bit more about those than the others. And then stop uh, 2G, um, 2G TK, so missing a T there, um, another um, specifically targeted at second generation TKI, so satinib, nilotinib, and pasutinib. So very brief summary, and this is a, a nice a medical slide that's, that those medically trained will immediately recognize what this means, but those not may, may not. So basically this means that you've got a hundred people at the start of this wiggly line. They were all in, uh, in a good medical response. And this shows you how many of them were still in a medical response or, and didn't have to restart their TKI um, at each time point. So by six months, you'd actually drop to about 40% um, of people were still in a major molecular response. Um, after stopping massive, but as you can see, this line flattens out. What we see flattens out. So actually, that forty percent stayed off their TKI if they, if by six months they hadn't gone back on it. Largely, so this is this is a classic what we call Kaplan Meier curve, which people may be familiar with. There'll be some more coming up. So this was followed up by the um, Euroski um, study, which was uh, devised by the uh, European Leukemia Network. Essentially, you had it was a bit more stringent about who could go into it. So the the STEM study wasn't particularly stringent about who was going into it. But the USG was, you had to be in MR4. So you had to be in deep neck response and you had to have frequent uh, monitoring of your, of your PCRs uh, as per this little schematic here. And relapse was defined as anything, loss of MMR, so anything about 0.1%. Um, and again, they excluded patients who had failed any prior TKI. So if you're resistant to a previous treatment, you weren't allowed on the study. So as you can see, similar sort of curves that we just saw before, um, slightly different scale, uh, different scale on the bottom, so it looks a bit shallower, but it's not really. Again, six months, you've got most of it. But again, this is sitting at about between 50 and 60 percent of people had a sustained uh, treatment free remission on this trial, um, which is pretty good, really. Um, um, and also, you can see that most people who did relapse did so by six, definitely by 12 months, the vast majority. So that's the, the time where you need to know the most. Um, also, what it did show is that if you were on your TKI for longer, um, you had a much less, uh, smaller chance of relapse. So if you've been on your TKI for less than eight years, you had a about a 50% chance, but it's about 30% chance if you've been on it for longer. Um, and again, if you've been in deeper response,
out, you had a better chance of staying in remission. So only 30% of people who had a five year deep, rem deep remission uh, re relapsed. I say relapsed, that don't get that's only loss of MMR. Um, and um, whereas 45% um, relapsed if they were, had a less duration of deep response. So just shows you the longer you have the treatment before you, you um, try stopping, the better chance you have of stopping. So um, on quickly to the DESTINY trial, this was the, the, the trial that was run from the UK, from the various um, centres in, in the UK. And essentially, the key difference between this and USG is that we half, half the dose um, in some of the patients. And um, basically, um, it, it was all about whether you were still in MMR three years, but this got um, people who were deep response, so MR4 and people who are only in MMR, were both were included in this trial as well. So, um, so this is the two cohorts. We call the cohort this, this a section of patients, forty nine patients of which were in MMR, so not deep macro response. Um, how many of them um, uh, relapsed after twelve months at half the dose? So this is halving the dose. So everyone got half dose. Sorry, I didn't clarify that earlier. Everyone got half dose for twelve months before they stopped, and actually. 20% um, roughly of people actually lost their MMR when you reduce their dose by half. Whereas if those, those patients who are in the MR4 group, so deeper response, actually very, very few, only two and a half percent of people um, relapsed in 12 months after halving the dose. So halving the dose sort of, the worst it can do is, is kick the can down the road. So, And this is what happened when we, um, so again, so that's the de-escalation, that's uh, halving the dose shows that actually most people stay off the treatment by 12 months if you just half the dose so shows you a good idea of um, stopping um the other thing that the um stop 2g tki trial did show is that um if you had failed um, um imatinib so you're resistant to imatinib um, and then you tried to stop your second generation TKI that you had afterwards. So you stopped your dasatinib, nilotinib, or basutinib. Actually, you had a pretty, pretty low sort of chance, around roughly about 20% chance of staying off your, off your drug. These are relatively small numbers. Um, but if you were just in, intolerant, so you didn't have resistance to TKI, you had a much better chance of staying off the drug. So this is why we will see when I talk about the guidelines in a minute that we want people to have been um, off their drug uh, sorry, we want, in order to try TFR, we don't want people who have failed so much because they're less likely to be able to, for it to work. So that, that, this is a good example of that. Um, so this patient, we talk about um, our patient that we described earlier. Um, uh, she entered the destiny trial. She reduced her dose of lotinib to 300 milligrams once a day uh, for a year and actually asymptomatic, felt much better on the reduced dose. And then eventually stopped therapy in 2015 and uh, remained in uh, complete um, in deep metro remission, so uh, MR 4.5 at three months after stopping. But she started developing some joint pains, which is another thing to come on to. So the, the, the key adverse event that people think about, apart from relapse, obviously, is uh, withdrawal syndrome. So in a good, good proportion of patients, um, about 30%, you can get some some joint pains, joint and, and muscle pains after stopping your 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 drug. This is typically in the shoulder, um, sometimes the hands and feet, and sort of um, muscle tenderness. And actually, not all the patients. Some of them had a history of other musculoskeletal symptoms, but not all of them certainly seem to be related to stopping the drug. And actually, we found that steroids actually helps in a lot of these patients because it's an inflammatory. Um, reaction to, to the withdrawal of the drug. Um, generally speaking, it's not related to whether you, you lose your MMR or not. Um, and also in the patients who did develop withdrawal symptoms, then they restarted the drug because they'd lost their response, they actually resolved the withdrawal symptoms as well. So again, this is just a, an example of the, of the withdrawal symptoms that we saw. So mainly these musculoskeletal pains. So our patients, they consider restarting medication because of the withdrawal symptoms, but actually they're slightly better. Um, and five months after stopping, actually she was still like, actually this is affecting my quality of life, withdrawal symptoms. So she had a relatively small dose of steroids, okay, being in some uh, 
in some contexts, but 20 milligrams a day of prednisolone and actually became asymptomatic pretty much straight away and then was able to taper the steroids away and the withdrawal symptoms didn't, didn't restart. So this is a good example of where steroids can help control symptoms. Better than restarting the drug if you can. So, and this is uh, what happened to the patient. So this is her on imatinib and then in nilotinib and off TKI, many years later, she remains in deep methylation. So what happens if you don't stay in remission? Can I just restart what I did before? The answer is normally yes. So when we're thinking about 95% of patients, you can just restart what you're on before, potentially even at a lower dose, and you can still um, get control of your disease. So even if you, even if you uh, fail tier far, it's not the end of the world. So this patient this is an example of a patient who at the start went into a good response, many years off treatment, and then they um, relapsed quite well, but then just were able to restart the TKI and back down into deep neck response relatively quickly again. And this is what we find typically happens when we restart people who have failed TFR. And even, um, you can maybe even restart a different drug, but most of the time you can start the same drug and still do very well. So this is just sort of, does it always work out? Um, most of the times this is sort of, we're talking about one in 50, and this one was one in 86 didn't regain um, major neck response after restarting. So as you can see, most people do regain response. So do we think we do, we do, do our patients um, a good, good turn by getting to um, reduce the dose for um, a year beforehand? Well, actually, we think we do. If we compare, difficult to compare two clinical trials, but the Euroski, this is the curve for Euroski, as we said, sitting out 50 60%, all of those patients were in MR4. In the DESTINY study, the MR4 patients, which is this blue line, actually had greater proportion of them remained off treatment. This is two years after stopping. So actually, that's a pretty good indictment, the fact that we think stopping um, is a good idea for our patients. It also re re reduces the risk of withdrawal symptoms. So what are the, what are the current, current guidelines? So this is a sort of example of the, the international guidelines um, going along. I can come back to this, but I will quick move probably swiftly on to our national guidelines. And this is the ones we tend to follow. So this is what our British Society of Hematology guidelines say. Um, that's the summary. The key points I think to bring out are patients have got to be on TKI for at least three years, preferably five years. They need to have not had resistance to TKI. So even if you're resistant to mass and did really well on second generation TKI, you don't, wouldn't technically meet the criteria for trying to stop. Um, and we need a sustained deplomectin response of at least two years um, in MR4. And basically, um, our national guidelines are because of destiny, you should consideration to reducing the dose of TKI by 50% for 12 months before starting, before stopping. And then how often should we monitor afterwards? So monthly for six months, six weekly for another six months, and then two monthly for another two years, and then you can go to three monthly after that. So that's what the national recommendations are. And it, this just tells you about restarting as well, which is a minor point, but that's essentially the whole recommendations on TFR. So what other factors do you need to think about in terms of um, TFR? Patients have got to be committed to coming to have their blood test more often, which is, can be a problematic. That's one thing I didn't mention in the earlier slides. Um, Molecular occurrence can occur at any time. So it doesn't mean you can just stop having your monitoring. And we recommend people monitor three monthly for the rest of their lives. Um, we don't know what's going to happen to patients in 20, 30, 40 years time. So ne never stop monitoring is always, always the key. Um, you can get withdrawal symptoms. Um, you can have a psychological effect on patients. Some people like don't like the uncertainty and thinking, oh my God, am I going to have to, we're, all, we're watching to see if I relapse. And if you don't, if, if not up for that, then it may not be it may not be for you. Um, the other thing is we didn't really do it during COVID because it was more increased blood tests. We didn't want people to come to the hospital for blood tests. Actually, we wanted them to stay away. Um, and you do need access to good quality PCR testing. Most labs in, in this country now can do two week turnarounds of their PCR, which go down to good levels. Um, every every lab in the country should be able to deliver that. So, in summary. TKIs can be successfully stopped in a lot of patients who have got 
deep neck response. Go by we go tend to go by the criteria unless someone is really struggling with their drugs. Got to get over those stomach blocks, and I would always advocate for dose reduction first. Um, we think that more people will get the opportunity to get to TFR when they're treated with a second generation TK up front. This is what I tend to counsel people up front when they're first diagnosed. You're more likely to get into DMR with a second generation TKI. It does, of course, come with other caveats starting the second generation TKI up front, but that's one of the reasons why we might take to satinib or nilotinib when you first start. And um, when we restart, that is a question that is not yet un answered, shall I say. But basically, even if you lose MMR, as long as nothing dramatic has happened, prognosis is still favourable for most patients. And also, this is a good way we'd be informed and ask some questions. So thank you to everyone who helped, to Professor Mojkovic, who has uh, helped me a lot in my uh, learning of TFR, to Joanna Large, my, my super CNS. Um, we keep me care for putting this on and everyone for listening. So thank you very much. Thank you, Guy, for a really helpful uh, introductory talk. Um, Trigon, I wanted to come to you first, if I may. I think um, my summary of of Guy's talk is I, I feel as though we're very much being uh, encouraged not to think of TFR is for everyone. Would you would you agree with that sentiment that we should be um, encouraging patients not to expect to to reach TFR? Um, so, as Guy uh, very nicely mentioned, uh, treatment-free remission is only for patients who are optimal responders and uh, achieve really deep molecular responses. Um, and there are some aspects of treatment-free remission which are quite concerning. So this is not a this is the new frontier, if you like, of uh, treatments um, in the current TKI era. But it's not mandatory, and no one will force it. And it's uh, an opportunity rather than uh, something that we should all strive for. So I think if you're a patient and you don't have side effects and you're in a good, safe place that's a very comfortable position to be in. Um, ultimately, despite all our efforts, we're only going to achieve treatment-free remission around 20% of the patients. So it's something to bear in mind. So I don't really approve of uh, um, you know, everyone striving for all zeros, um, but I think we should have um, very uh, good discussions with our patients explaining what the opportunities are. Yeah, definitely, thank you. Um, David, your thoughts on the, the goal of TFR, would you, would you agree? Um, I think it's very individual and, and personalised. Um, for some people, uh, it's just not the right thing, not necessarily medically, but maybe emotionally or for other reasons. Um, and everyone's going to have different sort of views on that. I mean, the kind of thing some people age will come into us. They will really want to maybe because they're young or maybe they're older and they think, well, actually, I'm doing fine. I'm, I'm, I'm not fussed. Um, for other people, it might be because they've got a lot of change going on in their life at present. And frankly, they could do with a little bit of extra worry. So it's it's there's not just the medical facts, I think, to take into it. It's also how that works for for the individual patient. And if it's something that they want to try or maybe it's something they want to try later, and, and there's no harm in staying on medication for a bit longer. So I will just say that uh, that uh, there was another slide that I didn't put in that Dragon alluded to. There's just a little, little visualization of what she's saying about how many people, 20% have successful TFR, roughly 40% mm -hmm. can try it. So that's. I think that's a, a really helpful um, visualization of, of the different groups there. Um, I just wanted to sort of pick up what David was saying, Guy, if I may. Um, do you think there is, I, I suppose what struck me as a person who has no medical training, but also no personal experience here is that the 40% risk of relapse that you mentioned in one study, um, how do you sort of bring those different figures together when you're talking to patients? Do they sometimes have a different perception of a 40% risk than to what you expected? How do you handle sort of different people's perceptions of, of what that risk of relapse might mean? That's a good question. I guess the thing is, I think the key thing is to explain to patients what relapse is. And mm. it's not like you've got acute leukemia and you're relapsing into acute leukemia and you've got 
10, 20% chance of long-term survival or something like that. It's not the same as that. If you relapse on, on your CML, and this is what we have to tell patients, it's not suddenly, oh my God, we can't treat your CML. You're going to die of your leukemia. It's absolutely not that. It is, oh, you just have to restart your drug. You're probably going to be okay. And okay, we have to tell them that it might not be. There's always that one in 20 where it doesn't quite work out with the same drug, but actually more, more likely than not, it will be fine. You'll just be where you were to start with. So if people say, if you say to people, you've got a 50-50 chance, I always say 50, it's easy to conceptualize 50-50. <laughs> um, some 60%, 40%, it's, say half chance. And I think that's a, that's a rough guide is that a half chance, it'll work great. You don't have to have your drug. Half chance, actually, you just go back on the drug and you'll be where you started, m mainly. And I think that's, the, that's it's basically saying, relapse isn't isn't the end of the world if you want to have a go have a go and if someone goes actually i'm not that bothered about i don't don't mind get, taking my tablets i'm not getting too many symptoms from it then you go well then don't, don't worry about it it's it's you're right it's, every part of cml treatment is individualized and this is definitely an individualized decision yeah we can come back to the uh not that bothered type patient later because i think that's a really interesting concept that we should talk more about nigel i conscious we're talking about uh, relapsing from TFR, TFR, which I know you have experience of. Did you want to add anything to to this whole sort of conceptualization of the risk of, of ending up back on treatment? Yeah, I think first of all, I'd agree with what Guy said a moment ago that it's if, you know relapse or restart. You're restarting treatment. You know you're coming back onto treatment at 0 0.1 MMR. Well, that's the goal that most people are actually getting to. So you're restarting from a relatively safe position. Um, I failed TFR, I went on Destiny, did 12 months on half dose, stopped treatment and for me had to go back on. Um, but I stopped very early, I'd only been on treatment three, four years. I'm personally currently on my own Destiny 2 at the moment. Um, I'm about nine months into half dose, um, 10, 11 years on treatment and my numbers are doing very well. So I'm having a go at a second attempt at um, TFR, which is a relatively unusual thing to do. Um, but I feel safe, confident. I've got MR4, 4.5, and um, I've got 10 years under my belt. So it, it's a personal thing. I know other people in my situation. I have almost no side effects, which would say, well, why are you even trying it if you don't feel poorly? But it's a personal choice, as, as David and a number of people have said. And I think I think the key thing is you need that blanket to make sure someone's looking at it and someone's monitoring it careful. If you don't, if you if you don't have that faith in that actually it's been looked at properly and you're having your monthly beta rables for six months, it's a different it's a different prospect. That and I'm 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 a consultant. That's not I'm not a patient, but I'm a, I'm a control freak. I want to know that my patients are getting monitored. I want I I I, I, I I'm against my patients. Uh, doing badly as, as much as they are. So I, I, don't, I don't like not knowing and not having the control over things as well. In answer to Nigel, we have done second stops, but, um, and, and in France, they've done third, fourth and fifth stops. Mm -hmm. So um, it, is, it is an ongoing practice, but of course you've got to wait another two years of deep molecular response before you, at least before you stop again. Yeah, I mean, I've waited about five years. So I feel actually reasonably confident and comfortable and if it doesn't work it doesn't work um so as i say quite philosophical about it i'm just noticing the type of question that's coming in um, and, and quite a few people are asking questions uh, sharing their their specific numbers with us and things like that um, i don't think that's something we'll be able to deal with today in this in this sort of format so i think that these are more questions that you need to have you know, speak to your consultants about. But I wondered whether, Guy, it might be helpful to bring up those BSH guidelines one more time and um, just sort of re-emphasise the how people should read them in relation to their own situation. If we could just go over them one more time. Um, yeah, there's several people asking us, if I'm on this, can I do this? And um, I think that might help answer those types of questions. The other thing about the guidelines is they're only guidelines uh, your patients are not on clinical trials. So if mm -hmm. you are uncomfortable about your PCR going up, even though it hasn't crossed the threshold, as Guy mentioned, of more than 0.1% or major molecular response, uh, you can certainly go back on TKI. It's, uh, it's, it's, as we've said, personalized medicine and a discussion between you and your consultant. 
absolutely definitely so, so just um, there were there, there were people that I think one of the questions was about trying stopping again or dose reducing again I think I think we've answered that one yeah <laughs> Nigel's answered that one uh, quite succinctly um and then we had, I'm just trying to generalize some of the some of the chats and make it without putting some asking people's questions so I think again you've got to look at where people are and can you follow the guidelines for TFI? Again, they're, as Jack said, the guidelines. I think having the deep molecular response, as we saw from that, that destiny data, you're much more likely to stay um, off your drug if you're in, uh, in MR4. It doesn't mean to say that you definitely can't. And also, it doesn't mean to say you can't dose reduce still, even if you're, you can, you can consider dose reduction if you're in MMR, but not deep MR if you're willing to have the extra monitoring to make sure you're still in MMR. That, 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 that's always a possibility. And it, it's about those individualized decisions. So dose reduction, definitely possible. And I think Jack and I have got a lot more experience with each other and fiddling around with doses all the time. We just, we try and dose reduce quite, quite quickly and quite if we can. If goal of TML is to get people on the minimum amount of treatment to keep them in, 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 in the place you want to be. So if you can get away with, giving less dose to get to the same spot that's i'm all for it personally yeah on that individualized point so maybe i've got something to add on that i think these are the 2020 guidelines i think are they um uh, yes, yes. Yeah. so i think but before these were out and there were no kind of guidelines um i wanted to reduce my dose but not with the intention of tfr just dose reduction really for side effects um and so myself and my doctor had a really good conversation about how how we might approach that what kind of guardrails we have in place about fluctuations up or down and what we kind of settled on was fair being fairly conservative because i had young children and all sorts going on so we kind of said oh i was on the saxon of 100 milligrams we said well listen let's drop down to 70 and test monthly and do that for six months and if, if everything's still pretty good and staying in mr4 which i had been for a what good long time maybe two years then we'll we'll drop again to 50 and we'll monitor again for a few months and, and see how we go and do we need to adjust up or down and we kind of kept doing that and we're really quite careful um, and to the point where I now just take 20 milligrams um, and my results are really just the same. They're really pretty boring straight line with the odd little blip up and down. Um, and we did that kind of put out guidelines in a really individualized way, what made sense for me, where I didn't want sort of lots of stress around this. I wanted to take it gently and slowly. Um, and so I think it's really important to have that conversation with your doctor and, you know, you're not just the output of an Excel spreadsheet which says yes, no, or this, that or the other. There's, there's lots to take into account and, and hopefully if you've got a good doctor, they'll, they'll work with you on that. Yeah, and I think, that, I think that's the key. It's got to be, uh, the guidelines are there to help doctors who don't know quite the data quite as well. Um, Dragon wrote, wrote wrote the guidelines, so she didn't need the guidelines to tell her what to do. But um, but a lot of a lot of doctors, a lot of people choosing CML aren't the people who wrote the guidelines and know the data inside out. So that it's for them, so they can be emboldened to take the best step for their patients. Not it's not a prescription. It's a it's a oh actually there's some there's some backup here. You if you're following guidelines, you can try these things because we know there's evidence behind it. I think that's the, that's the key. I think that's really helpful, really good context to these particular um, guidelines. Uh, we've had some uh, interesting questions come in. Particularly, there was one that particularly caught my eye uh, about TFR after transplant. Now, it's not specifically mentioned in these guidelines you've got here, but I'm assuming that obviously if you relapse after transplant, that's a particularly severe relapse. Is that a, a fair assumption? I don't to to Dragon or or Guy. Sorry, that wasn't very specific. I can kick me. off. Um, well, transplant is a is a completely different kettle of fish. Um, so often by the time you come to transplant, uh, you're you are a resistant patient, and therefore you're using and harnessing the um transplant itself and the immune mechanisms, uh, to suppress the CML that come with transplant. So um, what we do is still monitor after transplant, but if the PCR goes up, then we tend to see if we can withdraw uh, the um, immune suppression, which is a drug called cyclosporin. And um, further on, although we can use TKIs to help us with controlling this, the PCR, we do um, a procedure which is the administration of donor lymphocytes. So from the uh, original donor cells called lymphocytes, which tend to suppress the CML cells. And the whole purpose of going through the uh, quite 
uh, involved and um, tortuous process of a transplant is that uh, you are eventually not on a TKI. So there's more of a, of a, of a balance between the immune suppression and trying to use donor lymphocytes post-transplant. It's quite different from optimal responder, deep response, and then stopping TKI. Yeah, I, I, it's a different scenario. And of course, there are, there are some patients who were transplanted 25 years ago because that's all we had and then ended up on a TKI later. That's a, almost a slightly different because they may not have been the trickiest patients to start. We don't know, but that was just because of the timing of when things happened. I know there's a few patients out there like that who, who are on a TKI post-transplant because transplant was given, not because they had really difficult to treat disease, but because it was so long ago. So I think that, that's a slightly different group of patients as well but I guess the thing is we don't know about stopping post-transplant because none of those patients were included in the clinical trials so it is a it's a good question and one we don't really know the answer to but then there, there are plenty of people who've had transplant not on a TKI because a TFR works because the immune system suppresses the leukemia cells that's essentially how TFR works. you've suppressed the drug the, the leukemia enough that now it's up to your immune system to do the job um, with someone else's immune system, when you have an allergenic stem cell transplant, does that do the job? Yeah, potentially as well. That's why we do it, and it might do a better job of it. But do we know if you needed to go back on TKI to stop it again? I don't think anyone knows the answer to that. <laughs> the honest answer. Great. I think we've covered um, considerably who could go on TFR, but there's also been some sort of interesting questions. Uh, around the um, withdrawal symptoms and the cause of those. Um, you hinted, Guy, a little bit at the immune system being involved and then obviously mentioned it again a moment ago with TFR. Could you just elaborate slightly if, if, you, if you're able? So, I mean, yes, I mean, the job of your immune system, everyone thinks it's to fight bugs and the bacteria and it, that is very much a job of the immune system, but immune system fights cancer as well. So the reason why we don't all get cancer because abnormal cells crop up in your body all the time that could cause cancer. It's because your immune system can destroy those cells before they turn into a definable cancer. And that's that's blood cancers and not blood cancers. So um, loads of different hematological communities are, are utilising that effect now. People may have heard of CAR T cells being in the news, all that sort of thing. It's reprogramming bits of the immune system uh, to, to do the job of what chemotherapy was doing previously or what chemotherapy wasn't able to do. So we know that your own immune cells, normally T cells, that's the part of the type of lymphocytes, their job is to, is to keep cancer at bay. And it's, it, it's, it's difficult to know exactly what's happening, but we think that's what's happening in CML, in TFR. When people are at low levels, there are, there are still a few leukemic stem cells knocking around, but there aren't so much that they overwhelm the immune system and the immune system is able to keep a check on them and stopping, stopping them proliferating and going up. I think that's the best way I can describe it. I don't know if you want to <laughs> elaborate, Dragoner, on my, on my description. Um, so, no, it's, it's just that we don't know why some patients lose their response and some why some patients stay on. And even though some drugs do um, enhance that immune system aspect in those cells, um, the rate of treatment-free remission is no different between any of the TKIs. So it's entirely dependent on the individual and uh, their initial response. So we can't say that uh, giving uh, the TKIs uh, would help in any way for future treatment-free remission. Great, thank you. And may I ask uh, another question on withdrawal to you? Um, somebody's asked um, how long the, the joint and bone pain lasts. I think I presented a little bit of information on that in his presentation, but it, it, are you aware of any other data on, on how long that joint and bone pain is, is suspected to last? Sorry, that was aimed at you, Dragon. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so uh, TKI withdrawal syndrome. Um, so I think we mentioned that um, the drugs, they suppress BCR able, but they also suppress all these other signaling pathways. And it's thought that the BCR able doesn't come back, um, but all those other signaling pathways reboot. And that's the reason for the TKI withdrawal syndrome. And this is typically shoulder and girdle pain. Um, 
joint pain, sometimes sweats, muscle pain happens six weeks after stopping the drug. And um, in most patients, it's quite mild. So all you need to do is take paracetamol and wait for it to pass. But in some patients, it can be quite severe. Um, and because it's sort of a, a reaction of those pathways coming back again, we have used um, a short course of steroids because um, some patients have been uh, severely affected. So it's only um, what we would consider a small dose, something like 20 milligrams of prednisolone, and then we just taper the uh, steroid dose down. Um, so the aim is not to keep patients on steroids, it's just to uh, ride out that um, um, muscular pain that happens afterwards. So usually by four weeks, you're off the steroids and it can help patients a lot. How long does it last for? So um, from patients who have lost their response and had to restart their TKIs, the pain has gone. So some patients that who are even in a very deep response so this is worse than being on the drug. So they restarted in deep molecular response and the pain went. And we know that the drugs are also good for muscular pain as well. I know they can cause it, but they also are good to alleviate um, joint and muscle pain. Um, some patients have carried on with these symptoms for a very long time. Um, uh, we don't really know. So patient reported outcomes would be very useful for us, but some patients have gone on for a number of years. All of our studies were never geared towards TKI withdrawal syndrome. So it's something that we have to go back and ask our patients who are on the studies. So it's mainly a uh, personal and clinical experience, but I can't say that it will go away in everybody, unfortunately, yeah. but it only happens in 30% of patients. And if you, reduce your dose before you stop, then the intensity of the pain is, is much less. Yeah. Can I ask a question there? Is there any correlation between people who have pain when they start TKI treatment to whether they're more likely to have withdrawal symptoms when they come off TKI treatment? Or is there no information or anecdotal information on that? No, so we've looked at predictive factors for TKI withdrawal syndrome and then having joint pain before does not predict for you having joint pain afterwards. So we have lots of young patients who've stopped and had really quite bad joint pain as well without a past history. Thank you. That's a great question, Nigel. Thanks. Um, Nigel, may I come to you next? At somebody's point, we, we've talked quite significantly there about potential negatives of TFR and someone's just pointed out that for them, it's just a weird concept to rely on something so long, a, a drug, and then uh, they, they, it could be, an, an, could be an anxious time to then stop. Is that something that you felt personally or that you've heard from, from your engagement with the CML community more generally? So personally, no, I've no concern with that whatsoever. Um, it is definitely something I hear from the CML community. And to be honest with you, there's a lot of people I know um, and good friends of mine who are on um, treatment who are doing very well and they just fear stopping for whatever reason. And that's absolutely fine. Nobody should be pushed into it. Uh, from my personal point of view, no. Um, as I said earlier, I, I have negligible side effects and I always have. I've been very, very fortunate. So why stop? The reason for me is a very personal thing. I was diagnosed at 45. If I live to be 85, I don't particularly want to be taking a reasonably strong drug for 40 years. Um, um, that's my main reason for stopping, to be quite honest with you. If it works, it works. I have, maybe because I'm a reasonably informed patient, um, a, a belief that if it doesn't work for me, then uh, treatment will work once more, particularly having been down that route once and it worked once before. So um, as we said earlier, it's a personal choice. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Guy, it struck me that you mentioned fatigue as a quality of life issue in your presentation. And what are the other common sort of side effects that people tend to mention TFR to you about? Is there that like what's yeah i suppose what's the most common to, reason what, want, what, what side effects they want to get rid of yes yes I, 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 it, it it tends to be if someone's got a specific reason to stop drugs like they've got fluid in the lungs because of dysatinib or they've got diabetic problems because nothing that's different that's oh we've got to stick with drug give you something else or, or or stop a drug completely we're talking about the sort of low grade stuff which just makes people feel a bit rubbish reduces their quality of life because of the drug they're taking but not to the extent that you need to stop the drug and i think yeah fatigue is the like, like aches and pains 
Um, imagine with that that fluid retention, um, often the puffy eyes. Um, people mention skin lightening, especially people with darker skin. Um, that's a major thing that come, crops up in a massive, but people mostly are, are tolerant of that. They just say oh, that, that's, what, that's what's happened. Um, I guess headaches on Dysathenib, various people get sometimes get headaches on Dysathenib and you can get ongoing bowel problems like diarrhea, that sort of thing on, on some of the, the drugs. Um, other things that come up when our blood tests like kidney, gradual, gradual kidney impairment, that sort of thing is often... It's often going around, but um, I know that's that's just the ones off the top of my head. And Mr. Dragon's got any other one? May, really common one she wants to mention, but it, they're sort of things that actually affect your quality of life without really being that catastrophic. Mm -hmm. Dragon, anything you want to add? No, I think that's um, very comprehensive as an answer. Thank you, Guy. Um, it's it's just what the individual patient feels is affecting their quality of life, and it doesn't matter what it is, if it's changed for their pre-diagnosis person that they were, and they're trying to get back to that. I think if the molecular response is good, then uh, we would be happy to, to work with patients. And maybe for an, another um, uh, lecture in the future, then there are various studies which are um, introducing lower doses of TKIs upfront. And as we all know, as the uh, drugs have been licensed, the doses have all come down. So, uh, so long as the molecular response is behaving, then we can, with increased monitoring, as David said, reduce the dose and see if we can make patients feel better. And I guess that ties into one of the other questions I spotted on the chat as well about sort of reducing the dose, even if you qualify upon the guidelines for TFR, can you still reduce the dose? And the answer is, yeah, possibly, yes. I mean, you have to as long as you're aware of what the consequences would be. So it may be that you lose your MMR and you have to go back on the dose, or it may be that you'll go from deep neck response back into the MMR, which means that you can't, don't qualify for TFR in the future. And actually, if you persist on the higher dose for another two years, there's loads of individualized little things that would make you, but yes, re reducing the dose is not as bold as stopping. And as long as you're monitoring ad adequately, you can re dose reduce and, and, see what dose is best for that patient and again it's all individualistic it's what is the right dose for the right patient to to keep them in mmr and if you can get them in deeper deeper remission as well great but essentially yes dose reduction all for if you've got adequate monitoring and it's the right thing to do for the patient when you say it's not bold i assume you mean not as risky not, for not the as bold. No, with, you've still got a drug going in and instead of because most of the time when patients have lost you stop the drug and they lose their MR they're going from DMR to losing their MR within six months that's quite quick it does happen quite which is why we monitor monthly if you re reduce the dose it doesn't happen anywhere near as quickly normally the, the 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 levels going up and therefore you've got time to react and you've got a lot more things to fiddle with and, and things like that so I think it, it's not as yeah I say risky is not the right word it's not quite as a bolder strategy as, as, the, as TFR itself. Yeah. I think it was just a descriptive word <laughs> and I think uh, many patients say oh, I, I don't feel ready to stop completely for the reasons that Nigel was saying earlier and they say oh well, I might feel a bit more comfortable about reducing and then I don't have to come so often so it was a purely a dis an adjective I think. <laughs> yes and you don't have to suddenly go, oh I'm, I'm reduced for you I've got to stop now. No you can just carry on and reduce those as well. David, did it feel bold for you? That's what I want to know now. <laughs> uh, um, no, no, but but didn't it didn't necessarily feel bold? I I, I, did, I did it for for kind of mainly fatigue reasons on on the Saturn of hundred, um, and it was kind of a bit of an imperative with, with twins on the way. I was like, well, I'm not going to feel great on this. So so it, it was it was very much driven by a personal need to uh, to say what could I do, and so the so you know again just going more detail about the previous story, we thought well if I reduce dose. That, that might help with the fatigue. If that doesn't, I might be eligible for stopping. Probably not a great candidate, but maybe worth a try. Um, but thankfully it kind of did. Um, and so that kind of that kind of worked for me. Um, but but I've got a question for Dragon and, and, and Guy, if that's okay. Yeah. So if you've got a even if you've got a patient who's in TFR, they're still a CML patient, right? Yeah. yeah. If, they've been, if they've been in TFR for say 
10 years, 15 years, a deep response, would you ever consider discharging them? I wouldn't. <laughs> no, I'm afraid you're stuck with us forever. Yeah. <laughs> Every three months. I know that some, some of our colleagues in France and Germany um, do six monthly monitoring. But I just um, I just feel that it, six months is quite a long time. So uh, so we do stretch it to four monthly. I think that's a compromise, but um, you're never discharged. Many apologies. And, and that's that's part for me of the of the mental equation of it, because even if TFR you're successful, that doesn't mean you're not going to the hospital. It doesn't mean you're having your blood tested. You're, you're still a CML patient. Um, so that's just another part of the overall equation for the individual, I think. But but I would say in the in the in the post COVID era of telephone consultations, um, <laughs> people who are in sustained TFR and doing very well, those consultations over the phone are very quick and yeah. very unobtrusive. Yeah, um, I, I, don't, I don't mean it practically. I mean, I mean yeah. put it behind you in your life and forget that chapter. It's kind of yeah, that's not going away. You're a CML patient for life, right? That, that, that's it. Yes, and yes. that's fine with me. It takes a while to come to terms with that one. Yeah. But yeah. One question on, on testing then. So before I went into my second attempt at TFR, my testing regime um, a number of years ago actually dropped to every six months. Um, now, I know that's not particularly common round and about. What's your view on six month testing for um pcr testing for people who are in a good molecular position or should be be tested on a three-month basis because i was very apprehensive of that initially it seemed a long time for for drag owner really or, or either <laughs> um so when you're on drug all the factors that guy mentioned the screening for diabetes the screening for your kidneys making sure that the full blood count is okay um so i feel again more comfortable doing that um regardless of the pcr every three months and again colleagues across europe uh, tend to do everything every six months and the national guidelines do say that if you're in a complete molecular response then the frequency of PCR testing is three to six months. So you and your doctor can choose what you feel um, is the best for you. Um, maybe your doctor will do the PCR every six months, but the full blood count and the biochemical profile every three months. But um, most, most centers do this every uh, three to four months with a good response. I mentioned it really just so people are aware of it, because when it happened to me, it was a bit of a shock at the time and I was nervous of it. Um, and as you say, it's just, uh, I'm at one of the larger centers and it was the way they were moving. So I say it was more an awareness for people than, than, than a question as such, but thanks for the clarification. I have to say, uh, if someone wants to have their blood done free monthly, cause they have to, I, I would always say, yeah, that's fine by me, generally speaking, but yeah, it's again, individualized decisions, isn't it? About someone who says they're very keen to see their haematologist because they're lovely people which i hope is a nice thing for, for you to read i'm dying to see mine haven't seen them in two years so uh, but you've heard their voice yeah <laughs> well, we have actually got another webinar coming up about telephone consultations if anybody wants to talk about that topic a little bit more but i think that's a that's an important point david definitely i think one question i wanted to to ask uh, to, to you, Dragona, and also to Guy afterwards, is do, do we think dose reduction is not talked about enough with patients as an option over TFR? So I'm just conscious we spent most of this conversation talking about TFR. There are very strong guidelines on TFR. I'm not sure there's there's quite the same level of information about dose reduction. Is that, is that a factor in, in this conversation being driven purely by TFR? And do we need to sort of address that balance? So I think in the UK, if you're heading towards TFR, you will you will dose reduce because that's our national destiny study that all our patients kindly um, attended so frequently for and gave us the success rate, which is higher than the other uh, European and uh, worldwide studies. Um, but in terms of what's probably less spoken about is what Guy mentioned earlier is uh, dose reduction um, within your major molecular response. And I suppose that uh, the reasons to do it are, that are very easy to, to rationalize are of side effects. And I think most hematologists across the UK would reduce the side effects. What's not so commonly done is when you're reducing when there are no side effects because you want to prevent a side effect to come. I don't know what you think, Guy. 
But yeah, that's the thing. I think you're right. There is, this is guidelines on TFR, which are, are, are good, but maybe we do need some some more being more prescriptive about about dose reduction and actually being being more being more specific, saying actually dose reduction is okay, and the goal is yeah for the minimum amount of treatment for the the best effect. So, um, what's this, the second half was oh in terms of pre reducing future. Again, I think if you've got someone who you're probably not going to stop and you, you, you're on a drug which could have some lasting effects, actually getting them onto a lower dose to keep them in the MMR is what I would aim for in, in most patients. And I guess the age of the patient matters as well. If, if you're in your 70s and 80s and you're on some other drugs, taking this tablet, if it doesn't make you feel too bad, for the rest of your life it doesn't seem too much of a, a chore if you're, if you're in your 30s um then actually that is a big thing saying you've got to take a tablet for the rest of your life and your your treatment goals are slightly different depending on the, the sort of age of the patient i think as well as the other thing so whereas you might be like oh well, let's keep on the higher dose to a younger patient um because then you might be able to stop at some point whereas actually if you're in your 80s actually let's get you on the lowest dose that keeps you that keeps you ticking along that that's uh, it would be a, a chain a different tack i think nigel david do you think the hematology community could do more to sort of explain this rationale um are guidelines and that type of thing helpful for you as patients to understand the 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 decision making sort of i think you know the guidelines are you know, I think, as we said earlier, guidelines for maybe non-specialist hematologists, or, um, and, and they're not necessarily that easy to understandable by the individual patient. I think what is important, I think, and, and sorry if it's been long-winded, but I remember when I was first diagnosed, I remember reading about, you know, patient-led care and thinking it was the most ridiculous thing I'd ever read. Well, Doctor-led care, thank you very much. Um, and, and the more and more I learned about my CML and what I wanted my treatment to look like, um, the more and more I could have a good conversation with my doctor, which led me and her to come up with a plan around what we wanted to do. So, so just having a guideline, and you know, I just kind of liken it to plugging numbers in the Excel spreadsheet and coming out saying reduce, stop, don't, or whatever. I don't think is that helpful for a patient. That might be helpful for a non-specialist clinician. Um, I think for the patient, they need to understand what treatment goals are possible, um, and for them to think about what they want to get out of that and then have a quality conversation with their doctor who can steer the you know, steer their treatment in the right way. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I absolutely agree. The guidelines are, are not there for patients. They're there for the clinicians treating the patients. So they've got a framework to have that discussion with their patients. And you're right, the, the, the information and information that's, they go to patients, that's the best way to sort of give the the options about you. Uh, what's the phrase you used, Dave? I really liked it. I want to hear it again. Was it the patient-led care? Was it? The no, no. The latest said that the 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 goals of care. I can't remember what the phrase you used, but yeah. The... Oh well, at least it's been recorded, so we can yeah, go yeah, back. Yeah, right. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Um, that, I say yeah. It, it, the thing is, as a doctor, you have I have patients in my clinic. You go tell me what to do. I'll do whatever you say, and mm -hmm. I don't want to have any 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 uh, input in what I want to do. And the other end of the spectrum say. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I go. What is American? Well, I'm doing this anyway. And there, are, most people are on the scale and they're in the middle somewhere. And it is a conversation. But again, every patient has a different attitude to how much they want to make decisions in their own care. Because some people are petrified of making their own decisions. They really are. They don't want to. They want to leave it in the hands of the doctor. Others are uh, want to have big decisions. I, I personally find it easier when I'm suggesting something. The patient goes, "Yeah, I like that idea." Than me met with okay whatever you say i find it easier to be challenged than than uh, than just be <laughs> told oh, i'm doing as i'm told i think david mentioned about non-specialist hematologists and i think that's a very valid um comment because when i was first diagnosed um i was with uh, a hematologist who wasn't particularly a cml one and certainly as I, my knowledge improved uh, some of the things i was being told initially were not right fundamentally uh, and therefore, I think having the guidelines there for us patients to be able to refer to and to be an informed patient, um, not an over-the-top patient, but an informed patient to go and say, well, I understand this, I understand that, 
uh, it's a very useful thing. Knowledge is king at the end of the day, um, whether you do anything with it or not. But at least if you go into your uh, appointments with some knowledge, you stand a better chance of getting the best treatment. I can add anything you'd like to add. Everybody else has commented on this particular point. Just wanted to see if you wanted to add anything. No, but again, I think just finally closing on it is, is there's no right way. It depends on the person. But if you're not taking charge of what you want and where you want your treatment to go, you can't have too many complaints that it's not going the right way for you. I think the other thing I would add here, and this is 10 years experience, certainly, and I've used this phrase before, when you're first diagnosed, you go and see your haematologist and that's basically God sitting in front of you. And so you don't want to um, query um, things and raise questions, etc. As time progresses, then you get more confidence, you get more knowledge. And really, this is for the people who have um, been diagnosed relatively recently. You know, go in, ask questions. You're not going to get shouted at. You're not going to be told off by your haematologist. They will welcome that opportunity for you to ask questions and to question things. Yeah, my my, my haematologist is not a CMR specialist, but probably as you know, close as you can get to be when I bring one. And the, the wee voice had, as she said, I'll talk to you in scientific terms. And when you stop understanding, tell me, and then we'll talk about red balls and orange balls. Um, <laughs> and, and and that kind of really helps because, you know, we, we get to the limit of what can I can I can understand but I still get the full picture. So again, it's just, that's how I interact, not for everybody. Um, but I guess having one haematologist for a long time, I've had mine the same one for 11 years, is very helpful. Chopping and changing, I guess, makes it really hard um, and much more difficult to decide maybe what to do next. Would like to say that uh, it's very different now. So it's a very, very long consultation because we have so many drugs. So we have a choice of drugs according to what we want to achieve. So by the time you've explained what you want to achieve and the drugs you have to choose from, it does become very involved for the patient and their family. So uh, it's no longer imatinib transplant, which was a very, uh, very uh, overwhelming but straightforward discussion. I think that's actually a very fair comment because for David Knight, 10, 11 years, you know, there was imatinib, there was nilotinib, um, and there was basically disatinib. If you went on the Spirit 2 trial, that was it things are very different. And that's a very fair comment. I like so, oh, sorry, Guy, you go first. Clinicians, I, I, I'm talking personally here now, I, I, I like it when patients come to me with questions and, and, mm. and challenge me. Um, <laughs> I've, I've, so uh, we're probably speaking, speaking to converses here because this is all people who have joined, uh, <laughs> joined a <laughs> webinar and a forum to learn about it. But the more engaged a patient is with their own care, um, I find I enjoy it more <laughs> and I think they do better because they're asking the right questions and telling us the right information rather than someone who's not so engaged. But as I say, I'm probably preaching to the converted here. Can I just say something? Something just flashed up saying imatinib then transplant. That was 10 years ago. There are now five TKIs. 20 years ago, fair comment. There are now five TKIs. It's not a case of failing imatinib you go to transplant if somebody's misunderstood that. Thank you, Nigel. I was about to, <laughs> to jump on, <laughs> on that particular point, hopefully, and um, we haven't confused anyone there. Um, I really liked, Nigel, what you, what you said a moment ago um, about not being scared to ask questions. So I think so many people have uh, asked questions here in the chat and uh, Guy and Dragon have answered all of them. So I think what I'm going to say to people at home is that if you need these questions answered, don't be afraid to ask them to your haematologist as well. Don't wait for our next webinar. Absolutely. Uh, that's a really, really good point. And people have mentioned the sort of, oh, not a CML specialist is the haematologist, but m m almost all haematologists will be plugged into a network of specialists that they, they'll be haematologists doing lots of different things, but they'll have different specialists in other different hospitals to, to ask those specific questions for. So at King's, we provide the sort of the, the specialist advice to all the all the haematologists in Kent, Surrey um, and South East London, Kent, Sussex and South East London. So if, they, if that, that haematologist doesn't quite know the answer, they'll, they'll just just ask me in Dragonair. And that's like and that's that's the way that medicine is becoming these days. <laughs> People are becoming more and more specialists because there's so much more information out there, and it's and it's okay that your hematologist doesn't know all the data about CML, but someone does, and, and they should. There'll, there'll be someone they can ask the question to. Yeah, and and there's three. also the fabulous Facebook and patient care community that are always ready to advise. 
yeah I think the Facebook community are watching right now so hello to all of those people um what's coming through for me is that the relationship's more important um I think that's especially coming from from you David uh, from what you said now we are coming I'm pretty sure we have covered every TFR question and every dose reduction question as far as I'm aware so I'm going to ask a question I want to ask but this is just a message to everyone listening that if you did have something that you think we haven't addressed or you want to repeat your question because we haven't got to it because uh, I've missed it please do that now while I ask my question. Guy I wanted to pick up on something that was sort of one bullet point in your presentation there was a, a hint there that there was research ongoing in terms of getting more people onto TFR and I wondered whether you were able to elaborate on that or whether that was a, a slide on a project you're not actually involved in in which case it's fine. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> the the danger of also uh, amalgamating slides from other sorry. Um, yeah, there, there are there are ongoing projects to look at TFR. There is a plan, vague plan. I'm not sure. Um, Dragon will probably answer this today more, but about um, stopping um, more uh, in the second generation setting and the, okay. the second line setting where there is feasible for second line um, second line drugs. Um, because there's no license yet for stopping pasutinib, but if people have been intolerant to their first line and then on or second line and then on pasutinib, actually, can you stop? Well, we are, <laughs> even though there's no direct evidence for it. I think that's the simple answer. But in terms of what I think I mentioned is that we need to know a bit more about when to restart. I think that was one of the lines that I put in there. So again, because people are stopping now, not clinical trials tending not always to wait till people have lost their MMR and had actual relapse before restarting. If, if they've gone, they've lost their DMR and they're heading towards losing MMR, can I restart, but restart at the, the half dose they're on before? And actually that means they don't have to go back on full dose. We definitely use that tactic. Mm -hmm. and stopping, start restarting before you, you absolutely have to is also fine. Dragon, anything you want to add? So new trials for treatment-free remission. So the one that Guy mentioned, which will be a UK national study in stopping basutinib therapy. And basutinib on paper is not meant to um, reactivate any of those um, pathways that cause TKI withdrawal syndrome. So that would be interesting. Um, same for a simonib, but simonib is not licensed apart from for resistance and tolerance. So we probably have to wait another good few years before we look at a similar and treatment free remission. And then um, everyone's trying to get rid of that uh, sleeping um, leukemia stem cell, the CML stem cell that Guy mentioned at the beginning. So if you go in with some other drugs right up front and get really deep responses, and will that improve the outcome for treatment free remission? Drugs called venetoclax, which is uh, traditionally used for CLL or acute myeloid leukemia. And then um, other strategies which are in Spain and France, where you use panatinib for a short period of time to get a really deep response, switch to imatinib and then see if that improves your treatment-free remission rate or second relapse strategies. So again, go in with a very potent TKI and see if that gets you quickly and deeply to the right place and then stopping after that. And as a number of patients probably went into the National UK Choices Study, which was combining hydroxychloroquine with uh, imatinib. So that again, specifically targets the um, leukemia stem cell. Um, I mean, we have to remember that patients in deep molecular response is actually really well patients and they're tolerating their drug. They're in a really safe place to, to add in new potentially toxic agents is, uh, needs to be really thought about very carefully about what we will influence um, other than their CML, but uh, a whole plethora of TFR strategies coming your way. Dragon, on the dose reduction strategy, I'm aware of one trial looking at starting people on 50 milligrams rather than 100, which has some promising results. Is there more research in that area to, to maybe put people in at a lower level to begin with? So um, Guy, and, Guy and I often do that. So if somebody has some um, um, uh, issues about tolerability or if we're worried that their counts will, blood counts will fall quite steeply, then we tend to lead in with a lower dose and then work up according to the PCR. But it's really, really important to balance all of this with the PCR because 
I've seen a number of patients who haven't done well because they just stayed on the low dose all the way through and that's not the right strategy. So monitoring seriously is the key for all responses and for treatment-free remission. So that was an American MD Anderson study. Um, it was entirely in low risk patients. So I would say 95% of the patients were very low risk score. And on 50 milligrams of dasatinib, they did a lot better than the traditional 100 milligrams of dasatinib first line. The European Leukemia Net are not going to include lower dose uh, starting because it was a very small, very select group of patients. So at the moment, patients are being treated traditionally unless there's a clinical need to go in with a slightly lower dose. But we always use uh, some of the drugs on a, in a lower dose anyway, as many of the patients would have seen. We don't quite go for the standard dose that's prescribed. But more will come. I'm sure that um, this will be explored. And if we could ever get funding for a study in the UK, one question that's really interesting to answer is what happens as you dose reduce as you go along and you don't have side effects. But um, all trials need funding, I'm afraid. And, and it's a problem. Drug, drug companies don't want to give you funding for, for, for trials that are not going to be specifically not using their drugs. <laughs> Is there also an issue with getting funding to basically move people towards stopping taking treatment as well, of course? Well, those trials all have to be sort of initiated by hematologists, by, by academics. They're not going to be initiated yeah. by the drug companies, those trials. But, Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> that is uh, a fact of life. But, uh, but they, have, the they, haven't, they haven't put the blockers on, shall we say. <laughs> that would be... Great, thank you. I'm just... Uh, amazed by the the huge list of things still going on in, in CML and um, yeah keep my ear to the ground a bit better I thought I was in the loop um, but <laughs> clearly I'm not um, I will reveal a slight uh, ulterior motive to asking that question um, we are doing a, a webinar on um, how to sort of make decisions around whether you join a research project that um, this group may find useful um, so Thank you all for your time today. It, it's been a really fascinating conversation. Um, we did hold a webinar on the same topic a year ago, and clearly there's still a, a demand to keep talking about you know, TFR and dose reduction and the role it plays in patients' life. So thank you so much for, for coming back um, to, um, to talk us through your perspectives on this topic. David, Nigel, anything you guys want to say? I'm always keen to end on the patient perspective before I do go through my, my slightly dull slides um, at the end. And I guess just from my point of view, I noticed in the chat there were a lot of questions from people quite specific with I've been on this for this, not the other. That, that's maybe something they could ask on our Facebook group and we can help navigate those guidelines. But again, it's a question for your clinician at the end of the day. Yeah, it's really challenging to us to answer those kind of questions on a very specific person in this format. So, yes, please do make use of the, the forum, like David says, or indeed your haematology team. Um, and apologies that we just can't can't deal with that sort of question in this format. Nigel, anything you wanted to add? Not really, no, just reiterating the comment from earlier about um, being an informed patient and don't be afraid to speak to your clinician. Great, thank you all so much. I'm just going to run through some quick slides before we say goodbye to our speakers, just to make sure you're all aware of other things we can do to help here at Leukemia Care. So we've obviously got the webinars, uh, frequent newsletters, our magazine, which has been very, very popular um, this time, actually, a number of people saying, um, getting in touch, say they've uh, found the uh, the articles we've shared very helpful. So please do subscribe to that um, and a podcast as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I noticed a couple of people saying the terminology they were struggling to follow. I appreciate that um, with a topic like this, we have to sort of, sort of dive in into the technical aspects quite quickly. Um, and if you're fairly new to CML, I would recommend our our booklets to try and get uh, get yourself up to speed with some of the the terminology that we've used today. Next slide, please. Oh, there's our magazine um, with our, our new ambassador on the front for the most recent edition um, and how to subscribe on the bottom there. Next slide, please. Um, 
our next webinar is actually this coming Friday, so we're really <laughs> turning them out quite quickly at the moment. Um, this one's talking about how to cope with a leukemia diagnosis sort of emotionally. Um, it might be useful to both people who are fairly newly diagnosed and people who um, have been diagnosed for a while. The idea is just to talk about generally about um, the emotional impact of a diagnosis wherever you are sort of at since diagnosis. So please do come along regardless of, of um, who you are and where you are in your sort of pathway since diagnosis and hopefully you'll find that helpful. Next slide please. And uh, just a reminder of all of our support services, um, the CML Facebook group has come up many, many times, obviously it's not run directly by us, it's uh, run by our, our, the patients who are joining us today, but um, would really recommend that particular Facebook group. Um, if you're looking for more information, next slide please. And someone's already mentioned this in the chat, we have got a couple of upcoming support groups, the national virtual meeting, um, the date's yet to be confirmed, um, but the, the Hammersmith one, for those of you who are based in sort of the southeast, um, is coming up fairly soon and already um, booked in. If you want to attend any of uh, our support group meetings, where obviously you can discuss topics like this more on a one-on-one -on -one basis and see all the other patients' faces, then um, do look on our website so you can register your attendance to attend them. Some of them are face-to-face, -face, some of them are virtual at the moment. I can't remember which one's which, so do go and, and have a look and see what, what the plan is for the particular meeting you're interested in, because there's quite quite a lot of change going on in, in that respect. Next slide, please. A quick word for our buddy scheme. We've actually just started a short-term buddy scheme where we pair people up for a shorter period of time, um, particularly useful if you're newly diagnosed, I think, um, to sort of get some, some feelers from people. And it can progress into a long-term relationship if you prefer like our usual buddy scheme, but um, just a yeah, quick word for our, our new um, experimental buddy scheme there. Next slide, please. Quick word for our advocacy casework if you've got any questions um, both uh, on on sort of navigating your care or on benefits we've got a couple of people in the team who can talk to you one-on-one -on -one about those issues next slide please quick word for our counseling fund uh, if you're struggling emotionally with a diagnosis we and i know the nhs is also stretched on on mental health support don't forget we can help you there next slide please Quick word for fundraising. Um, obviously, all these sorts of activities that like these webinars do um, come at a cost to us. So if you are able to support us, please do um, and consider consider doing so uh, to help us sort of continue supporting patients in the future. Next slide, please. And a word for our Run 50 challenge. Um, if you are a runner, I'm personally not, but um, whatever floats your boat, um, you will receive a, a free t-shirt after you get your first donation, which um, is quite exciting and they are very nice, very nice t-shirts indeed. Next slide please. And a cycling one if that is more your thing. I personally would find that more exciting, although all the way to Paris sounds a long way. So um, for those of you who are fit out there, do uh, take on that challenge. Next slide please. Just some ways to get in touch with us. Next slide please. And our helpline and our support line um, for any questions at all on anything we've talked about today. So without further ado, thank you again to the uh, to the panel. You've been really, really helpful, a really engaging conversation, um, some, some lovely comments from people in the audience. Um, and um, thank you everyone in the audience for watching. And if you do want to watch it again, we are recording this. So hopefully you'll find that helpful. And we'll see you all again at the next webinar. Have a lovely evening, everyone. Thanks. Bye, all. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.